My name is Judy De Winter, and I'm actually very recently re-elected patient um, and lead governor um, and, uh, of, of the Royal Free um, NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. We've got trust members, members of the public, um, we've got mem representatives from the Royal Free Charity, um, and also a very special welcome to uh, Sir Trevor and Lady Daniela Pears. Um, as many of you know, know the um, Pears Foundation very generously supported um, the Institute of Immunity and Transplantation, which is going to benefit patients locally and far and wide. So thank you very much. Um, the Institute of Immunity and Transplantation, which we're now going to refer to as the IIT for the rest of the evening, um, it's a joint project between UCL, Royal Free Charity, and the Royal Free London NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and I'd also like to welcome here this evening um, from the Royal Free um, London Trust, our group chief executive, Sir David Sloman, and also um, the chief executive of the Royal Free Charity, Chris Burgess. As many of you will know, um, Medicine for Members events are governor-led events, and we're elected as governors to represent um, our, our members and the public. And when we plan these Medicine for Member programs, um, we consult with our membership. Um, and we do that in, also, in order to establish areas that our members want to hear about, areas of work at the Royal Free London. And tonight is as a result of overwhelming response that we received from our membership, which was that they wanted to hear about the work of the IIT, which is taking place in the Pairs Building. And they specifically wanted to hear about the science and about the benefit to patients. So that's what this evening is about. Now, w many of us, in fact, if not all of us, are aware that the project um, to date has not been without some issues. But as I say, I'm pleased to say that tonight is not about that. Tonight is about the work of the Institute and about the benefit to patients. We're going to have a Q&A session at the end, and I would ask you if you could, we've got some very interesting um, case studies and speakers tonight, but I would ask you if you could hold on to your questions until the very end, because then we can have a really focused Q&A uh, session at the end. Um, and as governors, we, we really want to hear about everything that you've got um, to ask and to comment on. Um, so, as I said, you know, this is, this is a very particular and specifically focused topic tonight. <laughs> Um, but if, you, if you've got any questions when it comes to the end about anything that's not about patients and science, so for example, um, the construction works or anything else that you would like to bring up, I would kindly ask you to direct those to Philippa Hutchinson. Um, and in fact, um, she's at the back there waving her hand so that you know who she is. So she's going to be around later, but also if you want to contact her, she's recently um, joined specifically to deal with any issues that anyone has to do with the Royal Free, the, Royal, the Pairs Building and the Institute. So her information is up there, um, but please grab her at the end if you'd like to. Um, also, can I get to that? Sorry, no, it's just type one tonight. Um, you can ask whatever you want, and if the panel don't think that it's the right forum to answer, then we will make sure that you are answered in the right forum, I promise you. <laughs> okay, um, as many of you are aware tonight as well, um, we've got local elections taking place in the next few weeks. Um, so we're in a period called PERDA. Um, so I'd kindly remind you that um, any members of the audience, um, that this is not an event to um, campaign or represent any political parties. Um, and also, if there are any journalists here, we have Ian Lloyd from our communications team, who, again, is happy to talk to anyone um, at, the end of the, at the end of the evening. It's really important to us as governors to get your feedback about these events and about this specific event. So you've got evaluation forms that are on the, rever on the back of your agenda. So if you wouldn't mind, after all the talks, completing those and handing them in to Duncan, who's going to wave, um, or anyone else that looks like they're anything to do with uh, what's going on here. We will all love to collect your evaluation forms, and as I say, we, we take those quite seriously. So in a moment, you're going to hear um, about two spe specific areas of work that's taking place at the Institute, type 1 diabetes, um, and also primary immune deficiency. Um, and you're also going to hear from patients who are here tonight um, who are involved in the work. 
you're going to hear um, about translational research, which is about delivering science to patients, otherwise known as bench to bedside, in a way that's only possible with co-location of patients, research, and clinicians, clinical work. So you'll hopefully leave here tonight with a better understanding of what the Institute, which is going to be housed in the PEARS building, is enabling that otherwise just would not be possible for patients. I'm a patient of the Institute and I'm a patient governor and I'm really proud of what's been achieved so far and what's going to be achieved in the future for patients. And that's as a result of the groundbreaking work right here on the site at the Royal Free. So I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker, who is the Director of the Institute of Immunity and Transplantation, the IIT, Professor Hans Staus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to see so many of you here, particularly resisting this beautiful weather out there and hopefully hearing some of the beautiful science that's going to go on uh, in the building. I would like to extend a special welcome to Daniela and Trevor, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, Trevor Pears for their support for the Institute. Thank you so much. So I'm Hans Staus. Uh, I was trained as a clinician in Germany uh, and then after I completed my clinical training, I went for seven years to America to be trained as an immunologist. Uh, and then I returned to the UK, where I spent some time at Imperial College. Uh, and in 2005, I moved to University College London uh, and started the research lab and the research department of, of uh, immunology here at the Royal Free Hospital. Uh, so my training and my interest is understanding the interaction between the immune system and cancer cells. And my interest always has been this question, is it possible to actually use the natural powers of the immune system to treat cancer? And we'll come uh, back to that. So as the director of the IIT, I would like to introduce the mission of the Institute. So we want to be an international center of excellence of patient-focused research to improve human health. It's an ambitious target, and I do think that we can achieve it. We have a strong basis to build on. It's going to be a joint venture between University College London and the Royal Free Hospital. UCL, in the last years, and hopefully in the, in the coming years, always has been ranked amongst the top 10 universities in the world. The Royal Free Hospital has a proud history and track record of innovation in biomedical research. So here we have the opportunity now in the new building to have 200 clinical scientists working together on this task to improve human health. So you will ask, okay, what topics then should those 200 scientists focus on? Uh, and the immune system is probably not uh, in the front of your mind. You might think, well, cardiovascular system. Uh, because there's a lot of health issues related to the cardiovascular system, the nervous system. But history actually tells us that the immune system probably has made the biggest impact on human health. And that's historically in the form of vaccinations. So what, what vaccinations do, they activate the immune system, and the immune system is then prepared to mount a robust response against invaders, against viruses, bacteria, and pathogens. As a consequence of activating the immune system via vaccination, some global infectious diseases have been eradicated. We now understand that the immune system doesn't only protect you from the outside, 
the immune system is also critically important to retain and maintain our internal health. And there's a golden balance required uh, in, in the immune system. It's a classical example where too much is damaging and too little uh, is damaging as well. So an, an exaggerated immune response can result in diabetes, arthritis, skin conditions, and liver disease. And I, may, I put those particular diseases on this slide because those are actually disease areas that are covered in the institute. An immune system that performs poorly predisposes individuals to cancer development. And people with an ineffective immune system have a high, likely higher risk of infection. And from our own research in the Institute, we actually also know that the immune system in old people has incompetence in terms of protection against infection. You probably don't know, but part of that incompetence is related to the fact that some 70% of influenza cases in the, in the UK that are severe cases occur in individuals over 65. So some of the research at the Institute is actually looking into the reasons for why the immune system is impaired uh, in, uh, in old people. Uh, and the current clinical study is actually exploring uh, the concept of enhancing immunity uh, in response to vaccination in old people. So our vision is to understand the causes of disease and to use this knowledge to develop new cures. So I have here a few examples of the type of research that meets the criteria of what we are trying to achieve. We will hear then later about uh, uh, the case studies on type 1 diabetes uh, and the case study on immunodeficiency. I just want to say a few words about the immune system and cancer. So we now understand that immune cells actually are very effective in attacking cancer cells. And we also know that there is a constant fight back from the cancer cells. So the cancer cells try to shut down the immune cells. And very often the cancer cells succeed and cancer develops in individuals. But we can use this knowledge now. We can take immune cells from patients. We can genetically reprogram those immune cells and give them back to the patients. So those are life medicines that have caused huge enthusiasm amongst the clinicians and that have also generated a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical industry. So there's an opportunity to transform cancer treatment, to use live cells, to use the natural power of the immune system to attack cancer uh, and to uh, eliminate it. Translational research is what we want and need to achieve in the Institute. And here's a diagram of components of translational research. So it requires expertise in basic research, expertise in clinical research, and it requires expertise in patient care. It is hard to achieve all this expertise and to integrate it. And at the moment, on average, it takes far more than 10 years for research development to be developed into a new medicine. And there are a number of reasons why there is such a long delay, but I've listed on this slide two important reasons. One is an institutional reason, and that is based on the fact that the research is typically done in an academic sector, and the patient care is done in our NHS. And those institutions very often work separate and there is insufficient links between them. 
The other reason are human barriers. So we've got scientists who work on the mechanisms of studying the immune system. And then we've got doctors, nurses who look after patients. So we've got two cohorts of individuals. You can see there's some similarity between them, but there's also a lot of difference between them. So there are different professional backgrounds, a different work environment, different daily exposures to, at work, different priorities at work, uh, and very often there is no aligned agenda between those two professions. So here is uh, the, the architect's view of the completed pairs building. And the pairs building will enable us to bring the key components of translational research together. So we'll have 200 scientists, biomedical scientists, working side by side, sharing facilities uh, and uh, uh, sharing expertise. Uh, and it all revolves around the patient. The patient care is priority, but then linking the patient care to disease-focused research and bringing those research, the research findings back for improved treatments, this is what we want to achieve in the Institute. So the building with the integration of, of, of those components will provide an effective means to deliver translational research. So this concept of translational research bringing university, the Royal Free Hospital together, persuaded the UK government to pump prime the project with an 11 million grant. So what we were tested, whether our proposal and our concept, whether it enhances the research activity of a world-class institution. And we clearly met this criteria. We met the criteria of having strong partnership between academia and, uh, 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 and other partners. And we also have the opportunity to contribute to economic growth. And on the next uh, slide, you, just can, you can see some of the excitement that is in the field of immunotherapy. So broadly speaking, immunotherapy is using the natural power of the immune system to treat diseases. The first is advanced is immunotherapy for cancer treatment, uh, and it really has transformed the treatment of some patients. So there have been clinical benefits and elimination of malignancies in patients who did not respond to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So the ambition is to use actually the precision of the immune system to, repla to replace chemo radiation uh, therapy, to develop a precision medicine where one treatment cycle can give lasting benefits. So the IIT is at the forefront of this transformation of using immunotherapy to treat conditions. And we not only want to apply this to the treatment of cancer, we also want to apply it to the treatment of chronic infection. We are aiming to, to, to rebalance the immune system to induce tolerance in patients with autoimmunity and in our transplant patients where the immune system tries to reject the transplanted organ. And then we also provide innovative solutions for our patients with inherited defects of the immune system. So the two uh, case studies that we've selected for today actually cover number two and three. So uh, we'll have a presentation uh, of, uh, uh, of type one diabetes, which is an autoimmune condition triggered by an overreaction of the immune system. And we have a case study of a patient with, uh, with an immune defect that, who has been treated in the Institute. So I would like to say a big thank you to the Royal Free, to UCL and the charity, the key stakeholders who have worked together to make this happen. I would like to thank our patients and the public patients have given us fantastic support 
The public has given us some fantastic support, and we are aware of the disruption that's caused for, for during the building period, uh, but we are excited by the possibility of creating this center of excellence at our doorstep. And finally, I would like to say a big thank you to the Pears Foundation for the generous uh, support of this project and to the other donors who also supported the project. Thank you very much, and I'll now uh, uh, hand over to Miranda Rosenthal and our patient. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Miranda Rosenthal, and I'm not an immunologist. I'm a clinician, and I um, work here at the Royal Free, and um, ha we have a large clinic of patients who have type 1 diabetes. We have about 900 patients uh, at the Royal Free, uh, 300 of whom are on pumps, and we also offer islet transplantation. So we are really quite a large center for the provision of um, care for people with type 1 diabetes. And it's really from that that I want to have a, a brief discussion before um, Lucy Walker talks about the science of immunology to talk about what it's like to have type 1 diabetes and the kinds of um, stresses and strains that it can cause, uh, as well as long-term health problems. So type one in type 1 diabetes, the body doesn't produce insulin. Um, most people, if you look at 10 people who have diabetes, uh, nine of them will have type 2, but we're talking about type 1, and it's really very different. When you eat, the body breaks down uh, starches to glucose, and insulin is needed to get the glucose into cells. If you have type 1 diabetes, the cells that produce insulin are destroyed, and it typically means that people have to use insulin injections for the rest of their lives. Uh, in North Central London, there are about 3,000 adults with type 1 diabetes and 1,100 children. We think that the, uh, the uh, number of new patients per year is about 60 per year in children uh, in North Central London. But interestingly, we don't know in adults because we don't keep such a tight register on it, but it's probably about the same. And what's happened in diabetes is a condition which was not particularly common, has become increasingly common in the last uh, 10 years, increasing by 5%, and also is now um, occurring in much younger children. So let's think about the day in the life of a diabetic. So I, I got this from Pinterest, and I thought it really did illustrate what it's like. So here we have somebody waking up in the morning feeling quite happy about life, checks their blood glucose level. Oh, no, it's not what they expected. It's high. So they then have symptoms because their blood glucose level is high. It makes them want to drink a lot, go to the loo. They take insulin. They think everything's going to get better. And then they eat, and the glucose level's going up again. They're worried again. They take more insulin. It's going down. They're having a hypo, and so forth. And so although I would like to think that we provide a, a very rounded service to support people to manage their own diabetes, if you think about the, a clock face, the patients will spend less than three minutes of the year if you think of the clock face as a year with their healthcare professional. The rest of the time, they're managing the condition themselves. And it is hard work. And it's also hard work in a group of people who are young, their children. It's often their parents who are having to look after them. And this causes um, huge amounts of difficulties. And these uh, quotes, I think, are also very interesting because it shows what it's like to be the bystander when your child is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Despite the support and the best care, the child still has to manage themselves and understand how to take their insulin and what foods to eat. So I'm now going to ask uh, Jess Harris, who is a patient at the Royal Free, who has very, very kindly uh, agreed to come and talk to me about her diabetes. Um, and let me just give you that. And we're just going to sort of do a Q&A just for some illustrative points about diabetes. So um, can you tell me what it was like when you were diagnosed with diabetes, how old you were and what happened? Um, I was 12 years old. Um, it was a month before my 13th birthday. Um, I'd been quite unwell for the majority of the year before with headaches, um, muscle aches, cramps, really thirsty, lost loads of weight. 
um, I'd been to the GP quite a few times and he kept telling me it was my age and I was okay. Um, and then one day after school, I was back at the GP and he said, oh, I'll just do a urine sample kind of to keep me quiet, to just tell me that I was fine. And he told me that I was going straight to the hospital with really high sugar levels and said that I would have just collapsed at school the next day if I hadn't have ended up there by chance. And so what happened next and how did that, how did you get on with school? I missed, I missed, I was in and out of school the whole time. I was always behind. Um, at school it was hard because I didn't want to inject with my, at lunch with my friends. Then because of the insulin re regime I was on, I didn't have time to do my injection in the nurse's office and then wait to get food because I would have hypoed. But on the other hand, no one wanted me to do my injection in front of the other students. So if I ate and then did my injection, I often forgot to do my injection at all. So it was quite complicated and I think uh, life is all already very complicated as a teenager without these additional things to be thinking about, let alone perhaps your parents at home wondering exactly what was happening. Um, so can we sort of fast forward uh, to where we are now? Can you explain where you are now and how diabetes has affected your health? So I've had, now had diabetes 17 and a half years and things aren't very good to say the least. I'm now waiting for a kidney and pancreas transplant. Um, I'm doing dialysis every morning and every evening. So it's hard, and, and I suppose that, well, thank you very much, Jess, that's really great, thank you. Um, I think what we, what I, I think is important to understand here is that um, in those years when you're a teenager and things are, you know, very exciting, which is not necessarily about your health, you're being expected to do a lot and manage a lot, and it doesn't always work out for people, which means that those years of having slightly high blood glucose levels can take their toll at a very young age. And so therefore, I think, you know, why do we need a cure? Because we can treat diabetes with insulin. I think we need a cure because it is an unforgiving condition. And the complications are life-changing. They're also very expensive to the NHS. And good control, excellent blood glucose levels, does not always mean that you can outsmart the disease. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Lucy Walker, who is a professor of immunology, who's going to talk about the science. I'm Professor Lucy Walker and I run a research team uh, trying to understand why type 1 diabetes develops and how we could potentially interrupt this process. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So um, as we've heard, type 1 diabetes is a relatively common condition. Um, it affects around 400,000 people in the UK, of which about 30,000 are children. And as Miranda mentioned, it's a condition that's actually increasing. It's on the rise for reasons that we don't really understand, particularly amongst very young children. So before the discovery of insulin in the 1920s, being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes was effectively a death sentence. So you would be told that you had a life expectancy of less than four years, and in fact many people died within a few months of diagnosis. So the discovery of insulin has changed this completely. So now somebody diagnosed with type 1 diabetes can go on and be successful in any walk of life. Having insulin has really changed the way we treat type 1 diabetes, but it's not a cure. And as we just heard, uh, there are still significant challenges and problems remaining. Insulin allows us to uh, manage the condition, manage the symptoms of the condition, but it doesn't actually address the cause. So the discovery of insulin was a game changer. Now, to make the next step change in how we treat type 1 diabetes, we need to actually understand why this disease develops and find new ways to interrupt it. So, why do some people develop type 1 diabetes? Well, we know that uh, the genes that you have play a role. So, if you have a parent or a sibling with type 1, you're more likely to develop it yourself. But it's not all about the genes, because we can have 
identical twins who effectively have exactly the same genes, but one of them may develop diabetes and one of them may not. So that tells us that there are also environmental factors that contribute to diabetes development. And there are all kinds of different environmental factors. So this is you know, the country you live in, uh, the infections you've had, your lifestyle, diet, lots of different things. And how these environmental factors affect diabetes development is very poorly understood. But if we think about the genes, if we look at the genes that are associated with the development of diabetes, here we can start to get some really quite big clues about what's going on. Because the genetics of type 1 diabetes points very clearly to the involvement of the immune system, and in particular to a subset of immune cells called T cells. So the immune system travels around the body in the blood in the form of white blood cells. So as you know, the blood is red, and this is because of the red blood cells in it. These are the cells that carry oxygen around the body. But if we take a blood sample and layer it onto uh, a special separation fluid, and then we spin that tube in a centrifuge, we can actually separate out the blood into its component parts. We find all the red blood cells spin to the bottom of the tube, the plasma, which is the liquid component of blood, is the yellow part up here. And then the white blood cells, which are the immune cells, they're found in this layer here. So you might just be able to see a white fuzzy band. So those are your immune cells. And there are lots of different types of white blood cell and they each have a different function. They each help us to, inf to fight a particular type of infection. But the type of immune cell that's responsible for causing type 1 diabetes is the T cell, which is this uh, sort of bluey green cell down here. And T cells are very important cells of the immune system. These are cells that allow us to um, have memory of previous infections so that we can respond faster if we get um, infected with the same microbe again. So these are the cells that we stimulate with vaccines. So as Hans was talking about, we can um, vaccinate the immune system, stimulate the T cells, and we're allowing it to remember and uh, provide protection against a particular pathogen. So T cells um, are a very important weapon in our immune defense, but if they're not properly controlled, like any weapon, they can misfire and cause unwanted damage. And in type 1 diabetes, the target of that unwanted damage is the pancreas. So this is the pancreas, um, it lies in the abdomen, and within the pancreas tissue, there are these little clusters of cells called islets of Langerhans, each of which is about the size of a grain of salt. And within those clusters are the cells that make insulin. It's the beta cells, the orange cells in this picture. And what happens in type 1 diabetes is that the T cells go into the pancreas and they target their weaponry against the pancreatic beta cells, so they kill these insulin-producing cells rather than killing invading microbes. And this is what it looks like in real life. So this is a pancreas section that's stained brown for insulin. So this is a healthy islet here. Here you can see in type 1 diabetes, there are blue T cells that are starting to infiltrate that islet and destroy uh, the insulin-producing cells. And on the right, at a later stage of disease, we can see that the islet is almost completely destroyed and there are hardly any of these brown insulin positive cells remaining. So we've been very interested in trying to understand what type of T cells are responsible um, for this destruction because there are actually many different kinds of T cells. So we've wanted to know which is the kind that actually targets its weaponry against the pancreas. 
So we've set out to capture and study T cells from people with type 1 diabetes. And we've done this using um, a piece of equipment that we have in the IIT, a sorting machine that allows us to flow cells um, one by one past a laser beam and then get information about each one of those cells as it goes past. And if it's a cell that looks like it's a cell of interest for us, if it's a cell that we want to study further, the machine is able to flick that cell out into um, a different collection tube for us to uh, then study. So most of the cells that are coming through are falling into this left-hand collection tube, but here, if we've got a particular cell that we want to study further, the machine is able to acquire a charge uh, onto that cell and allow it to be deflected into this right-hand uh, sorting tube. And what this means is that we can end up with a tube that's full of our precious cells that we want to study. And we've been able to uh, study those cells, analyze them, and look at the genes that they're expressing and ask, okay, what are these cells like? What flavor of T cell are they? What kind of weaponry do they have that they might be using to attack the pancreas? And by doing this, we've been able to identify a particular type of T cell that's present at higher levels in people that have type 1 diabetes. It's called a follicular helper T cell or a TFH, but the name doesn't really matter. What matters is that we now know the type of cell that we're dealing with. So why is this important? Well, the information that we've been able to glean about these cells tells us about how these particular T cells are likely to behave, the kinds of mechanisms that they're likely to use to cause damage. And this means that we can design new strategies to try and halt that kind of damage um, and use these to design new medicines. So we're also starting to study what makes this particular type of T cell develop and what signals allow these cells to survive. Because again, if we can interrupt these signals, we may be able to dampen this damaging immune response and reset the balance of the immune system. So the key point is that if we can understand that chain of events that leads to the development of type 1 diabetes, we can then design ways of interfering with it and slowing or stopping the disease process. So to summarize, we're studying the way that the immune response causes type 1 diabetes, and we found this new cell type that's associated with the response. And this provides new ideas for the development of, of new treatments. And importantly, uh, this finding that we've made has now been confirmed in at least three other labs worldwide, so in Cambridge, in the USA, uh, and in Finland. So this shows that the findings are robust, but it also illustrates that actually the research that's being done here at the Royal Free really is at the forefront internationally. And I think what underpins this is this very um, constructive interaction that we have between immunology research and clinical activity within the Institute. And this is something that we're very excited about building on further uh, in the new PEARS building. So I wanted to finish by just showing you the people in my team that actually do all the hard work um, and also acknowledging my funders uh, without whom none of this would be possible. So. We will move on, I think, at this point. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, so Lucy's been telling you about how the immune system can overreact and cause problems. I'm going to go to the flip side and show what the effects of an immune system that underreacts. 
and how that can affect patients. So today, when you travelled here, you may have come on the bus or on the tube, um, walked through the corridors, you may have sat in the garden this morning on a nice sunny day, and you've all have been exposed to bacteria, fungus, fungus, funguses or fungi, I should say, uh, viruses, that could potentially cause you harm. And the reason that they don't, the reason that most of you here are well, is because you have strong immune systems that protect you from those infections. You've already heard that the immune system is very complex. Lots of cells with lots of different and complex names. Most of those immune cells are produced in the bone marrow. Um, and they are critical to enabling you to fight off the normal bugs that you find in your environment. So I'll give you an example of the sort of cells that are really important. There are these cells, which we call phagocytes, and they chew up bacteria in the bloodstream or in tissues, and they digest them internally so that they are cleared from the body. There are other cells, important cells called B cells, and the cells that they produce called plasma cells that produce antibodies, and antibodies are special proteins that bind to bugs and help eliminate them from your system. In addition, there are t different types of T cell, and there are important T cells that we call CD8 T cells that are very good at picking out and identifying s normal cells in your body that have become infected by a virus. They bind to the virus-infected cell. They inject poisons into that cell that lead to that cell being destroyed and again allowing for the virus infection to be cleared. Here is a, a video, um, I hope this will work, showing um, a red cell, which is a T cell, on the surface of a virus infected cell. And you can see how closely it's interacting, it's almost enveloping the virus infected cell. And this goes on every day in your body. And on this morning, this afternoon, this evening, this is going on all the time. But what if you were born without an immune system? What would happen to you? Um, this young boy was called David Vetter. And for some of you in the audience, you might know him because he was called the boy in the bubble. He was born in Houston, Texas in 1974. And they knew, the doctors knew that he might be at risk of having a weak immune system because his brother had been born with a weak immune system and had died in infancy. So they prepared a bubble for him and he lived in that bubble for 11 years. And when he went out of the bubble, he had to go out in a space suit which had been designed by NASA. Unfortunately, he died in 1984, because the treatments that we have now that are effective came too late for him. It's important that paediatricians and GPs look out for young people who might have an impaired immune system. So you need to look out, for example, for a child who has a serious set of infections that don't respond to antibiotics, or an infection in an unusual place that children don't normally get an infection. Those people should be referred to a hospital for further investigation. But thankfully, um, these conditions are rare. They're caused because the instructions for, that allow immune cells to work are faulty. And you know the instructions for how cells work ultimately come from their DNA, which encodes genes. And some people have faulty instructions. The genes are mutated. We know now, because of advances in gene sequencing, that there are over 300 separate disorders that lead to a primary immune deficiency. So in the UK, that's about one in every 17,000 people, so 4,200. But the list of disorders is growing rapidly because now we're beginning to sequence whole genomes 
for patients. We're now beginning to recognise more and more disorders. The pace of change, the pace of recognition of these new disorders is accelerating very rapidly. And knowing the genetic cause is really important for families. It's important not only for the patient, but also for parents, brothers, sisters, and maybe their children. It's also important because it helps us decide what the best treatment might be for that patient. I presented an extreme case. I, expend, ex, ex, I presented a case of the, that young chap, David Vetter, with a very severe primary deficiency in childhood. But what we're now recognizing is that not only do patients with primary immune deficiency present in early childhood, they can sometimes present later in life. And the institute here is actually particularly focused on young adults and older people who present with defects in their immune system, which we're now beginning to understand can sometimes arise because of genetic defects. Now, I'm very lucky that today Jake Cracknell, who I first met in 2015, about three years ago, in fact, yeah, um, came to us from Cambridge because he developed a set of problems in later life that we, together with Cambridge, found related to a primary immune deficiency. So Jake is going to tell you about uh, his story, and then I'll pick up after that. Thanks, Jake. Uh, hi, um, yeah, my name's Jake. Um, I'm from Norwich, so um, that's why I was treated at Cambridge. Um, when I was about uh, 14, I was first diagnosed with uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, up until that point, I had completely normal childhood, never kind of sniff of anything wrong, really. Just kind of a bit lanky, but that was it. Um, uh, but yeah, when I got to 14, I started um, getting symptoms, kind of itching all over my body, um, really bad night sweats. Um, and that was about, um, yeah, so what's that? A good few years ago. But um, I, I went to the doctors, got diagnosed. There were quite obvious signs of um, Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma. Um, I was treated in Cambridge for that. Uh, it took about six months to, to treat that. Um, but um, over the course of about a year and a half, I was treated, and that was kind of that. Um, I was well for, for a short period, and then um, a different cancer returned, which was a non Hodgkin's lymphoma, so it's, uh, another lymphoma. Um, so I ca uh, came back to Cambridge, was treated again, um, uh, again successfully treated, but um, a uh, immune deficiency was identified and that's when I started uh, with what was referred to Ron with um, with this immune, immune deficiency because of the uh, the cancer being treated I was trying, uh, treated with chemotherapy and um, radiotherapy as well both I responded really well to but um, there was still this it kept them coming back for and weren't quite sure why so um, after I was treated for the second cancer, I was um, uh, started being seen at the Royal Free, had a uh, bone marrow transplant in, uh, yeah, tw so 2015, in June. Um, I was uh, on the 10th floor here for about three weeks, I think. Um, and it, yeah, that went really well. I was treated by Ron and the team and everyone. And it, was, um, it went, I think, as well as it could have done. I'm <laughs> still here, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was let out for a week. I had my birthday, actually, in that week. Um, then came back for another two weeks because I missed it or something. <laughs> um, but, but since then, I, I'm, I've, I had to defer going to study at university for... Um, for about two years, so I'm, I'm now in my second year in university, I'm 21, um, which is about two years late, but um, I'm studying up in Leeds, studying music, um, yeah, really enjoying my life just because of, yeah, cause I suppose because of the work that was done here, and um, yeah, that's about it, yeah. Thank you. 
when uh, I first met Jake, um, you've got a lovely mum called Malka, and uh, I did um, she I did get the sense from her that when she was um, handing you over to my care, that you know I better get it right. Um, and it was lucky because I had uh, my second son's your age, and so uh, I could connect, you know, on that level, and that, that was very important. Um, yeah, so he. Jake had two lymphomas, Hodgkin's lymphoma, then a different type of lymphoma a few years later. And the reason these occurred was because he had an immune deficiency, a genetic immune deficiency, called CD27 deficiency, CD27. And hopefully, um, we will show you some slides on that in a moment. <laughs> but what's happened is at some point, very early in life, um, um, maybe um, before you were born, a mutation has arisen in a gene, in two genes, um, that encode a protein called CD27. CD27 is a protein on the surface of a white cell. And it's a critical protein because it's essential for white cells of the immune system to talk to each other. If the CD27 protein is absent on the surface of the white cell, the cells can't communicate, and the immune system doesn't work. Now, in some patients with CD27 deficiency, nothing happens. In other patients, they have a defect in the production of antibodies. So the treatment is to give them antibodies from normal donors once a month. And this is what happens for many of our patients at the Royal Free. But C27 deficiency is also associated with a very specific defect in the ability to respond to the virus that causes glandular fever, the Epstein-Barr virus. And for reasons that we're beginning to understand, this protein, when it's absent, means that the body can't handle that infection. And we know now, don't worry about the names because there are um, a whole group of names here. These are other disorders when, which when they're absent in patients also lead to the same problem. So there's a group of disorders where the immune system can't deal with one particular viral infection, Epstein-Barr virus. Now, you may know that uh, glandular fever occurs in teenagers, okay? But what you don't know is that most people who contract the EBV virus don't get glandular fever. It's only 10%. And for the most part, uh, people get swollen glands, sore throat, tired. It usually occurs around the time of exams, which is not great, but they recover. But patients with CD27 deficiency sometimes get glandular fever, but it's really, really bad. And in fact, before Jake got his second lymphoma, he got glandular fever, which is very, very severe. Sometimes the Epstein-Barr virus can directly lead to not only swelling of the lymph glands, but cause cancer of the lymph glands, for example, Hodgkin's lymphoma. And in the second lymphoma that Jake got, that was caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Sometimes, because the body can't handle the viral infection, it begins to overreact. And it overreacts by producing lots of chemicals that go into the body, into the bloodstream, and make patients very unwell. So sometimes, these patients have to go to intensive care. Sometimes patients like this are diagnosed on intensive care. Now, Jake, when they made the diagnosis, was different to his brother and sister because his sister, who's Martha, um, who's older, did get glandular fever when she was younger, and it was quite severe. And she also has CD27 deficiency. But she's remained well. She's doing well. Jake, on the other hand, had more problems, two lymphomas. What we've been trying to do at the Institute is for the first time create 
a clinical and scientific team focused around primary immune deficiencies for adults. My colleagues, Siobhan Burns, David Lowe, and Matthew Buckland, who are immunologists. My good friend, Emma Morris, and myself are bone marrow transplanters. And we work together to try and design the right therapies for individual patients. Martha didn't need a transplant, but Jake did. And the reason we were able to make that decision is that we used a wealth of information. We used laboratory data, we used the clinical features of his particular case, we used information that we have from the registries where other patients with primary immune deficiency, their data is kept, for example, in Europe. Um, for other patients, not, not in particular Jake's case, but we might use genetic information, um, sequencing uh, not just one gene, but hundreds of genes, and maybe the whole genome to make a diagnosis. And these working together, not only uh, with our team at the Royal Free, at the Institute, but also with colleagues internationally and across the country, we can begin to make decisions that are right for individual patients like Jake. And in his case, we made a decision that the best therapy was a transplant. And we were lucky to identify an unrelated donor, and we proceeded to do that transplant in June 15. But there are other options. We might, for example, try to correct the gene defect by using gene therapy, or we might use other treatments uh, that are available depending on the, the, the precise patient. So for a transplant, for those who don't know, we identify a healthy donor with a healthy immune system who is matched to the patient. We then do uh, give the patient chemotherapy and immune suppressive drugs that remove their bone marrow immune system and allow them to accept a graft from a healthy donor. And the process of recovery takes many weeks, but now Jake has a normal immune system uh, three years down the line. The Royal Free has been at the heart of a large program to treat young adults with primary immune deficiencies of transplant. We have published the world's largest series um, in, the, in the last three or four months. And that not only has that achieved quite a lot of attention in the, the press, but also it's changed NHS policy. In January of this year, we changed National Health Service policy so that these transplants that weren't routinely funded are now routinely funded. Jake's case was actually important in us establishing the importance of this and the success of this treatment to the National Health Service. Other patients, we don't select a bone marrow transplant because there may be other options available. So we have a patient, for example, we have other patients with other gene mutations where we can correct the gene defect using gene therapy. So the way this is done currently is we insert a copy of the normal gene into a specially modified virus. This virus is used to infect stem cells from the bone marrow, and these stem cells are injected back into the patient. And uh, although this treatment is used quite commonly at Great Ormond Street Hospital in younger children, not so often in adults, but we have begun to extend this to young adults, and uh, Emma Morris uh, and uh, Adrian Thrasher from Great Ormond Street perform one of the first gene therapy uh, procedures in an adult with a primary immune deficiency a couple of years ago. And again, uh, we're pushing the boat out, showing what is achievable uh, in this group of patients. <laughs> Things are going to get more exciting because of new technologies that allow us to perform gene editing that is, first of all, more specific and secondly, safer. And those treatments are not yet available, but they will be available in the next 10 to 15 years. And the IIT, I hope, will be at the heart of that revolution. But that revolution and that journey is not going to be possible without uh, the support that we get from the public, from the World Free Charity, from the Trust, from the University, and from the Pairs Foundation. And for that, I thank you. Thank you.